Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I've been a designer. This is our 35th year uh, as being a designer. I know I don't look it. Um, and we've done all sorts of things. But, and I could, we've got some amazing projects at the moment. We're designing the new uniform for TfL for all the underground, all the drivers, all the buses, all the trains. We're, we're leading the transformation of the East Village, uh, sorry, the uh, Olympic Village into, pub, into a public place to live. Um, and we've got some amazing regeneration schemes. But I think because you lot are a lot younger than me, I'll talk, about, or most of you anyway, I've seen the, I've seen the odd one. Um, I'll, um, I'll talk about some of the things in my career that were pivotal, pivotal things and, and the way that we've gone about things and, and kind of been able to survive and adapt and make, and make money for, for 30 odd years. The first thing to say is that when I, when I was growing up, the idea of being a designer didn't exist from, from my background. It was never mentioned. It, if I'd have said I wanted to be a designer, and I wouldn't have known what it meant, I'd have been given a clip round the ear by my nan and said, get yourself a proper job, you daft cat, or something, something to that effect. But today, we're really, really lucky in that design is, is seen. I mean, you may not... I, I'm, a, I'm on the uh, trustee board of the Design Council and the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, so I get to see what, what industry thinks about design, and we're in a very, very good place. Uh, as a designer now, increasingly, we're being, and, and you are being respected as somebody that can contribute to um, life, positively to life, and that's financially, that's socially, in all the ways that we know but actually industry is starting to, to understand that now. And you, you're knocking on an open door, but you've got to knock on those doors. And, and if you do, uh, a lot of industry knows your value. Just, just in terms of what this room... I've tried to work out what this room is worth. So, you know, here it's... I, I understand it's mainly design. Well, that's worth 15 billion to the economy. If you add in all of the creative, creative industries, which is telly, um, you know, film, architecture, it's now reached 50 billion. And that makes us the second biggest driver of the British economy and the second biggest employer. And that's power. That's absolute power. Uh, and so, so always think that. You're not in a Cinderella industry. When I, for many years, um, probably until about six or seven years ago, I, I think I was in a, a Cinderella industry and I, you, you weren't taken seriously. Now, uh, you, you really can be taken seriously. Uh, and, and there are lots of these figures. I'm not going to kind of go, go on about them. But if, if you don't use the... Uh, Design Council website and you want to prove your value. There are so many ways that you can go on that website and prove your value. Uh, very importantly as well, it, for me, I mean, uh, we've, got a, we've always had a saying at Hemingway Design that design is about improving things that matter in life. The most important thing to me as a human being is to be happy. And I think designers and creative people can contribute towards being happy as much as, any, as anybody can. And, and there are so many figures like this, I'm not going to read it out, which prove that, you know, si simple things like the lowest truancy rates in school are in what we do. Uh, and that, that counts for a lot. And therefore, we've also got to be political. You know, I think designers have to be massively political because at one side, we've got industry that's recognising us and on the other side, we've got idiots like Michael Gove. You know, um, most people here are British, are they? So you know who Michael, if Michael Gove is. If you don't, look him up. You know, who, 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 who really doesn't understand and who is trying to devalue what we do through the English baccalaureate. So we've got to fight as well. And, and you'll see in a few minutes all the way through, I've been a fucking fighter. <laughs> um, so myself and... I'm going to talk about we for a bit because none of what I've achieved, what, what, or what we've achieved, would have ever happened without meeting a, a fantastic lass uh, when we were still uh, kids, still teenagers, met her in a disco. That's where you should meet your wife and your partner, isn't it? Um, um, and we, we, Geraldine left school at 15 with no qualifications whatsoever, but, uh, and, and I had no idea that what I wanted to do. But the things that mattered most to us in life were dancing, buying records, watching bands, dressing up, fashion. Um, and, and I think if you can, you know, we'd, nev we'd never thought that we could live that as a, as a career and earn money, but we started to. We came down to London when we were both 18 in 1979. We'd, uh, we'd no idea why we came down. Well, we did not what we were going to do apart from there were more clubs to go to, more, you know, more bands to see and more places to buy second-hand clothes. And that was the only reason we came down. The first, the first thing that I did was I, um, I put an advert in the Windsor Castle uh, pub in, in Camden and formed a band, which everybody should. That's me on, on, the, on the left over there, look with the long blonde hair. Um, which, is, which is me? All right, yeah. So, and, 
And like anybody that's been in a band, you know, I didn't, m m most people didn't get famous, cost me a, load of, cost me a shitload of money. Um, what, one, what we decided to do was we'd empty our wardrobes. I've always worn second-hand clothes. Today it's called vintage. Uh, we, and, and Jerry didn't, obviously met, made her own clothes. So we emptied them onto, onto Camden Market. The rent was six quid. We took a hundred odd quid. Within a, within a few weeks, we, we, I was going around every single second-hand shop, every single jumble sale that I could find. And, and, and then we, we found out from my nan, which is always a good way of finding out things, where she found out where the rag and bone man took second-hand... You'll have to look that one up, some of you. Where the rag and bone man... <laughs> Took, took second-hand clothes too, and he, uh, he took them all to this, these things called shoddy yards, which is that bottom, bottom left thing there, which that's where the word shoddy clothing comes from. Uh, and we went there and we gave examples of all the things that we wanted them to collect for us to sell on Camden. And there was these old, old deers sat on a, next to a conveyor belt, who, and they would be picking... So all, all, it was prototype recycling. So all these clothes would get taken to this shoddy yard. They'd go on a conveyor belt to the top of the building and all these ladies would pick out, one, one would pick out blue cotton, another one would be picking out red wool and they'd drop them down these chutes and, and then they'd get compressed into bales and shipped off to get recycled. Well, we were saying, don't, don't drop that cream jumper, that Aaron jumper, because we want to sell that on Camden and we'll give you 10p for everyone that, that you save for us. And those old Dr. Martins that, you, that you're going to send away, Give those to us, we can sell those. And, and it became, it got, we got to the point where we were taking quite a lot of money on, on Camden, filling vans up of stuff from these shoddy yards, which were only in Dewsbury. Um, and, and, then we, and then we made the big, the, the big thing. We, started, we always look inside, as, as creative people, we always think, you know, what do we want? I, I, we, I don't think we've ever stepped out in our careers out of what we're comfortable with and what we would wear ourselves or design ourselves or live in ourselves. And, and I've always, you know, as a kid, as a teenager, I always wore Dr. Martins and, you know, through my Slade years, through my Bowie years, through my uh, punk years. And, and every time we got a pair of, every, every time we got a pair of DMs, um, on Camden, no matter how beat up they were, we'd sell them for more than a new pair that were being sold in a shop round the corner. So I just thought, where do we get more of these? And I, I tracked them down before the internet. This tracked Dr. Martins down to a, a, a factory in Wellingborough, went up there. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd learned something from my pop that he, he had, when I was young and a pair of my Dr. Martins had split, he took them into his shed and he got a soldering iron out and he soldered them. He, he, he melted the soles and, and, they, and let them solidify and put the line back on in the shape of the Dr. Martin sole and they never split again. And I just thought, I wonder if Dr. Martins have many of those broken shoes. I wonder if it happens a lot. So I went to the factory. It ha it, they did have loads. They had 600 pairs in this worn returns department, which were going to go to landfill. I paid 15p a pair, I think. Uh, bought them all. Uh, came back down the motorway, bought six soldering irons from uh, Texas DIY, which is today's B&Q. All the band were on the dole, paid them a pound each, and they sat there and they soldered these Dr. Martins. You can see, that, you can see them there. So this was in 19... This, by then it was 1980, 1980, probably around then. And you know what? It ended up with me and Geraldine taking £5,000 a day uh, on Camden Market in cash, at the age of 20, we bought our house in London for cash. And, <laughs> uh, and it, it was amazing. But, uh, Ger then, Geraldine then took a stall in, uh, in Kenny Mar Kensington Market. I mean, not many of you. Yeah, we've all got to fight for Kensington Markets to come back. Kensington Market, how, how many people here work in a, a, shared, a shared building space where they pay a, a de not, not too expensive rent and, and they're in a community together? Quite a few people. It's become the norm. Well, Kensington Market was, was, was that. It was a shared community, but in a prime retail location Kens on Kensington High Street, right opposite uh, Urban Outfitters. You know where that is. And today it's bloody PC World uh, is Kensington Market. And, and um, within that, there was people who... Geraldine took a sewing machine in there. She rented a space which was smaller than the size of this stage and it was £18 a week. She took a sewing machine in there. She didn't come up with a label. She just made eight items of clothing and stuck, stuck the fabric in the corner so when she sold one piece, she'd make another. Around her, there were people who were starting off as graphic designers, as, as people wanting to start hairdressers, as, as tattoo artists, as people selling bootleg tapes of last night's Joy Division concert. Or, you know, everything that was about being young and, and having a go at, at a cost-effective way. 
And, and Geraldine then got a... So, so Geraldine had got, again, no experience. She didn't put a label or anything, but she just thought she'd have a go. Within a second week, she got an order from Macy's New York, who came into, who came into um, Kensington Market. We, we, we didn't even... Evidently, London Fashion Week was happening down the road. We'd never heard of London Fashion Week. Why, why would we have? You know, from our background, it just wasn't, just wasn't on, on the horizon. They ordered um, 200 of each of her eight styles, um, she took the order. I couldn't believe it. On a good day, she could make three items. I don't know what. <laughs> but, but that whole thing is about just do it. We weren't going to hurt anybody. If we, if we hadn't delivered that order, well, we, wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we didn't know they existed in the first place. I'd never heard. I'd heard of New York because I did geography at school. <laughs> she probably didn't leave in school at 15. Um, but um, but I'd, ne- you know, I'd never travelled to New York. I'd never heard of Macy's. Ne- neither had she. What, what did we do in a situation like that? Well, we went for advice and we went to the, the BKCEC, the British Knitwear Clothing and Export Council, and they said, who's your manufacturer? And I said, her. And you know, it was all starting to go t- t- totally and utterly, utterly, you know, tits up. So what do you do in a situation like this? And again, I would advise you, you know, to do this whenever you get the chance. Ring your mum. Went outside, no mobile phones then, went to a phone box, rang my mum. She was working as a waitress in a cocktail, but not quite. <laughs> uh, she, she was working in a pub in Blackburn. She, she worked behind the bar in, bar in a pub in Blackburn. She decided, she'd, know, she'd seen how much we had been taking, because she used to come down on a Sunday night to help us count the money from Camden, the whole family, because they'd never seen money like it. <laughs> and, and when they weren't there, we used to just spread it out on the floor and roll about in it naked. <laughs> um, so... So she, she, uh, she said, right, I'm going to pack in my job. She, she, her and my nan had always been able to sew, because that's, you know, we'd always watch them do that. And she said, I'm going, I'm going to set up a unit uh, in, in Blackburn. I'll buy a load of second-hand machinery, and we'll make this order. We'll do it. One of Geraldine's sisters left her job working for... She was working for Riley's Snooker Tables in Accrington. Uh, uh, another, another one went part-time. Geraldine's dad moonlighted. Geraldine's dad was a truck driver, and he moonlighted and did the deliveries. And my stepdad, who worked for ICI, came in and helped, and helped with, with things, and it became just this family thing. And, and we delivered that bloody order to... to uh, to Macy's and we got another one. Geraldine kept, we came up with the label Red or Dead. We, we, that, that, was our, that was our first brand. And, and, we, and 19 years after s- starting that, we sold it to give us enough money to basically do what we want to do and choose any project we want to do and say no, and, and, which is an amazing position to be in. Um, so I've, that's kind of the first 19 years of my career and I've done all right, 12 minutes. Less than a minute and, a, and less, less than a minute a year. Um, <laughs> What did we do next? We'd no idea. When, when, we, when we'd sold Red or Dead, we'd no idea what to do other than we hadn't, we, had, we hadn't set out to be fashion designers. We hadn't set out. But, but by now, we were... Red or Dead was always a very political label and, and, and did all sorts of things. And I, I, I really do believe we changed the fashion industry for, for the better in, in many ways. Um, but we just then thought, well, what do we want to do next? Well, we, we, want, we, we said we want to carry on changing things that we, because we didn't like the fashion industry. You know, there's still a thick lot of things I don't like about it today. Um, and then, so the next thing we said, I, well, I was, sometimes you just have to react to things. And I was on a train from Paddington to Bristol. And I looked out the right hand side. If you, any of you have traveled that way in, in the next few weeks, months, um, look out of your window, of the train window as you're traveling west. As you pull out of Swindon Station, you'll see this. I, I saw this when it was being built, and it had Barrett's flags all on the out, Barrett the house builder flags all sticking out from it. And I, I looked at it, and I thought, hmm, that's, I knew, I've got four kids, um, one, one at 27, 27 tomorrow, sorry, 26, 23, and 16. And I was thinking, this is the housing that's being built for that generation, and a lot of the generation in here. And I just didn't like it. And, and I kept, all I could see, I kept seeing something else. I kept imagining it could be something else. Can you, can you imagine that as something else? So did a few of you said prison, yeah? Am I right? I think I heard the word prison. Who said prison? So you there and a few, and a few more. So we did, I did that. <laughs> Very simple, obviously, obviously easy, easy to do on Photoshop. But yes, we had a laugh about it in the office. But then what, what do we do? What, what do we do as designers, bearing in mind that every single Monday morning we meet as a team and we remind, us, we remind ourselves why we're here. We're about improving things that matter in life. 
this mat housing matters in life. It matters so much more than whether stripes are the new, sorry, whether black is the new brown, sorry, Pantone. Uh, it, it, it matters so much more, whether, whether stri more than whether stripes are the new spot. So, uh, you know, and it matters so much more than what font to use. This is about this is about quality of life, about health, about so much. We thought, we've got to do something about that. So I sent that, I emailed, I found out the email addresses of the head of the planning authority in Swindon, the local paper, the, the editor of the local paper, the owner of the local radio station, and all of the council planning committee, and we sent this. And I, 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 eventually, well, within a few days, I was on the front page of the, the Swindon advertiser, yes, um, <laughs> um, saying... Um, Wayne Hemingway MBE says that we all live in prisons. You know, typical, typical crap from papers. We all live in prisons in Swindon. Then I was brave enough to go on a phone-in programme and I was, you know, pulled from pillar to post people in Swindon saying that I was devaluing the value of their houses. And I was saying, but this is not fit for purpose. This is just, this will be a slum in 25 years. It can't, we can't improve it. It's just absolutely awful. Um, and, uh, and then I was promptly banned from Swindon. We didn't stop there. This, this was great fun. We gained no money out of it other than this, this, it felt right. And, and I think that's what being a designer is. Sometimes if it feels right and if it feels like you're making that change and the changes that we all can do, that all the brains in this room can do, you just go down that route. And something, it's, what's that film, Pass It On, you know, where you, from a few years back, if you do something good, and, and, you, and you believe in something, it often does come back. When you just chase money, sometimes it, it, you, go da, you, just, you just go this, down this endless, endless, worth, worthless route. So we started to do the same. I saw some housing in Gateshead. I saw some housing in Scunthorpe. I saw some housing all over the place, and we did exactly the same process. And what happened was next was, um, I was, it all seemed to happen within two weeks. I was invited to write an article about it uh, in the independent and I came up with the words the wimpification and the baratification of Britain and attacked the, the, the national house builders for building as noddy boxes and all this not fit for purpose stuff and the amazing thing that happened was then I was I was asked to go on to um, Newsnight with Jeremy Paxman in a debate with the house builders and he sided with me the next morning after that the chairman of Wimpy contacted us and said he wouldn't want his kids to live in housing like that and he agreed with everything that I was saying would we work with them and we went to meet him. He said, right, I've got a 750-unit development in a really rough part of Gateshead, which I've not known what to do for a while, a space to build, sorry, space to build 750 homes. Would you design them? And Geraldine just said, yeah. We'd never designed any housing in our <laughs> life before. Not, we'd not designed, we'd, we'd, we'd done our own house, but that's very different. But imagine, imagine somebody saying 750, and we'd never studied architecture. Um, I'd, I'd done some geography. Uh, um, you know, but how many people here believe that they could design a house? The majority of hands are up. Of course. How many of you are architects? Why? I'm not going to... None of you. Because... And why, why can you design a house? I can't, we haven't got time for, for you to shout out and we haven't got mics, but I know why. Because you live in them. And because you care. How, how many people here, you know, are, feel, how many people here aren't fashion designers? Most. How many people here feel they could design a, a shirt? Most. Obviously, it's bloody, I'm, I'm saying the bleeding obvious. You know, you must never, we have never pigeonholed ourselves. You must never pigeonhole yourselves. You're, you're the creative industries and you can be creative. Anyway, uh, I've got six minutes left, so I'm going to crack on. So what did we do next? When you don't know about something, everything is out there to find out about how to do it. And everything, all the pointers are out there. And how did we find out? Well, I just kept my eyes open when we were, when we were researching about this housing. I saw this on a flight to New York on, in Time magazine. British youth unhappy, unloved and out of control, an epidemic of violence. And I looked at that and I thought, that's what we're supposed to say about American youth. You know, we're supposed to be better. How can they say that about, we're good in Britain. They're naughty. They fight. They, they, they start wars. We don't do that very often. Um, but but then, you start dig, then, you start digging then you start digging behind that and you see that we're actually bottom. Britain was bottom of the UNICEF study of child well-being. Highest teen pregnancy, 
18% of, of our population are under eight, sorry, 18% of our prison population are under 18. This is, this is design, by the way. This is what I consider design, finding out this and being able to act on it. And the next highest, in, the next highest is 9% in Germany. So, I, and I kept thinking, could anything of that be to do with the fact that we're building housing developments that were quasi-prisons and giving, forcing kids to stay inside with no play areas and all of this and giving them a completely less chance of having a free-range kids' existence that I had. And then I kept looking at these and, you know, think, and I, st I stopped blaming them. I, stopped, I, I could still blame them for wearing fake Burberry and things, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but stopped blaming them for, for being, giving it large in a Pete Tong style on a Friday night and, and us avoiding parts of the town, town centres. Um, you were on a train from Chichester, weren't you? Were you on a train from Chichester this morning? Not you. Oh, it's, right, so it's not that town centre. You look very similar to somebody anyway. Um, <laughs> Um, and um, and then, I, then I just went out and took pictures everywhere and I kept thinking there's no, there's no wonder that those kids are giving it large in a Pete Tong style if you give them five springy chickens to play on <laughs> so the, the, all, of the, all of the point all of the pointers were there and then I look back, then I look back this is where I was brought up in Queen's Park Flats in Blackburn and, and what does that look like to you I, I will listen, shout out what you think it looks like a ruin in it a playground. It was a giant playground. Some, some, some. Um, it was an Ameri a, a very enlightened American uh, landscape architect had, 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 let, had bequeathed us just this amazing place. We used to cardboard down those hills on a wet day, long before they'd invented snowboarding. It was just this giant, giant playground. This is where Geraldine was brought. This is still Geraldine's family house, a two up, two down uh, workers' cottage in Paddy, and that's my niece, Mef, ne my niece Meg, and my nephew Tom. But that, that house has got everything about what, what quality of life is about. It's got a, the, rec, the recreation area to play out. It's got, you can build your own lean-to on the back or and turn it into a kitchen. It, it might be a two-up, two-down worker's cottage, and she's one of five daughters. Work that one out. Two bedrooms, five daughters. Mum and dad you know, stayed together all the way through it. Uh, but it was still an amazing place to live and an amazing and it's been kept in the family so it didn't become it didn't become rocket science you just look in yourself whenever you do something you step outside you just have to look inside of of your own life because design is about your life um and so then and then we and then we ch we knocked everything we turned turned everything on its head we said to wimpy we are not go they said to us show us the houses that you're going to design no we're not going to design the houses till the end anybody can design a house we're good and we said to them because um, we, has anybody here ever lived in a, a, a home because they love the home but they hate the place where it is? One or two people, one or two people. But the majority of us, 98% of us, will buy into place first and, and choose a location, it, it, whether it's suit close to your work, whether it's a place where you can take the dog for a walk or, or, or it's got a swimming pool close by where you want to swim or kick a football or whether it's close to your mum or, or public transport. You know, you, know what, you know, you buy a place and then you'll find the property after it. And they said, no, we're house builders and you've got to show us the houses. I said, that's your problem. You, you don't think about place. And so, and so we, we then said, the first thing we're going to build is the play areas. And we, and, and we went to the, the council play officer and we said to them, well, we want to build play, play areas like this rather than springy chickens. And he said, oh, we love your idea about, about free range kids, but you can't build a play area with sand on the ground. And I said, why? Because dogs will come and do stuff in it. We'll put a fence around it to stop. No, you'll have to put a fence around to stop the dogs anyway. It's because, he, said, he said, it's because babies will crawl about and eat the sand. I said, that's no problem. We can replace it. It's only one ninety nine a bag in B&Q. <laughs> and, then, and, and then Geraldine went on, on to Google and Googled, child eats sand and dies. And, and, and do you know what? You can't find that. Try it on your iPhones. Or, well, actually, no, on your Windows phone, the better. Um, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, you, and you can't. And so that... That, again, we were able to change hearts and minds. We changed planning policy in Gateshead, and we, we were able to deliver play areas that were... Because, obviously, that's more interesting. You've, you, some of you are not that far out of being kids. You know that it was... You know that 10 years ago... You know that 10 years ago, that was more exciting than sitting on a springy chicken and rocking, <laughs> rocking like that. So, you know... But to us, that, that is what design is about. I've got 30 seconds. This, I'll, I'll show, this was the area that we took where we did the 750 homes. That was the first street... 
that were quite amazingly the houses, the, the, the two bedroom houses we built, we built them and sold them for £99,000 and even the four bedroomed houses were, um, were only £140,000. The whole development is finished now, but it's just about finished within the next few months. It, it's won awards, but the most important thing is it's a really happy place to live. You know, it's a place where you can bring up kids. The streets are full of serendipity. That table, tennis table, has been there 10 years and it's never been vandalised at all. It's generous. Design is about generosity. That, that development is everything that, that I believe... It, it, this is a highlight of our career. We do all sorts of things, but if there's one thing I want to be defined by, it's the Staith South Bank in Gateshead. Um, we, didn't, we didn't plant any plants. It, they came on the back of a truck uh, and people, had, people came back came out. And, uh, and did the planting themselves. That, 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 that engendered a sense of community so that kids didn't ride over the, 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 the plants that they'd planted. It, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, it's obvious stuff. We, gave, we were generous every, everywhere, the communal barbecues. Um, my time's up, there's a red light, come on. There's loads more I could say. Thanks for listening, have a good day.